The film opens with a happy children's song which is promptly interrupted by Lemony Snicket, a mysterious narrator, addressing the audience directly. He warns us that we should not expect a pleasant movie. Instead, the movie is a tale of orphans, various weird, dangerous things, and misfortune. We are introduced to the Baudelaire children, 14-year-old Violet, the eldest and a resourceful inventor, the middle child class, an avid reader who remembers every word that he has ever read and the youngest Sonny, a quick-witted child with sharp teeth with which she bites down almost everything. One day, while playing on the briny beach, the children notice Mr. Poe, the Bottle Air family banker, approaches them. Mr. Poe informs the children about their unfortunate fate. Their parents have perished in a fire which also completely destroyed their magnificent mansion. As the children travel back to their home, Lemony Snicket narrates that the exact cause of the fire is unknown however. He and his friends have discovered that it was due to the refraction and convergence of light from a great distance. The fire had devoured everything, leaving behind a smoldering pile of ash, and unanswered questions about the bottle air's parents. Hidden in his father's desk, Klaus stumbles upon a brass spyglass, sparking curiosity and a yearning for more answers. But the harsh reality is that the once joyful bottle air children are now orphans, facing an uncertain future. Mr. Poe, their banker and temporary guardian, informs them that he would handle their parents' remaining assets until they came of age. However, Mr. Poe is obligated to entrust them to their nearest relative, Count Olaf, who is a distant third or fourth cousin or so Mr. Poe thinks. As their car rolls to a stop, a burst of delight initially washes over the children. The charming little house adorned with pink flowers seems to promise a haven, but their joy was short-lived. Expressing her condolences for their loss, the friendly Justice Strauss clarifies that the lovely home was her, and Count Olaf lived across the street. Turning the corner, a grim reality awaits them. A crumbling, dilapidated house stands in stark contrast to the splendor they were used to. Count Olaf, with his exaggerated theatricality, welcomes them in. But despite his over-the-top performance, glimpses of his greed and cunning sneak through. After Mr. Poe confirms the court would finalize the custody arrangements on Thursday, Olaf swiftly ushers him out of the house, leaving the bottle air orphans alone with their fears and uncertainty. After the banker leaves, Count Olaf's facade crumbles. He boasts about his soon-to-be wealth, despite the dilapidated state of his house. He gives the children a grim tour, showcasing the rat-infested cupboards, decaying backyard, and their own crumbling bedroom. Everything seems on the verge of falling apart. Every morning, Olaf saddles the children with endless chores while he spends his time practicing acting with his troop. One day, while the children scrub the floor, Olaf demands dinner for him and his troop by 8 p.m. Violet and Klaus, with their combined wit and resourcefulness, manage to whip up pasta. However, Olaf throws a tantrum demanding roast beef and slapping Klaus for not anticipating his desires. He gleefully reveals his plan to enjoy their parents' money while they toil for him. Klaus reminds Olaf of the law preventing him from accessing the fortune until Violet's 18th birthday. Violet threatens to expose his mistreatment to Mr. Poe. In retaliation, Olaf locks them in their bleak bedroom. Desperate, Klaus begins tearing the window apart, trying to escape. He even blames their parents for not leaving a plan. Violet intervenes, calming him down and building a small sanctuary with salvaged items from their burnt mansion. The day arrives for the court hearing. Unfortunately for the children, Olaf gains legal guardianship. While driving back, he feigns regret for his behavior, offering to be a good parent. As an olive branch, he stops at a general store for drinks. However, this is all a calculated act. He parks the car on a train track, locking the doors to trap the children inside. With a sinister grin, he waltzes into the store, wasting time until the train hurdles towards them. Inside the car, Violet receives a call from Mr. Poe. Desperately, she attempts to explain their predicament. The car is about to be hit by a train. Mr. Poe, ever the oblivious banker, misinterprets her pleas, believing the children are driving the car. Coincidentally, he's driving next to a train himself and dismisses her call, promising to call later. Dejected but determined, Violet seeks Klaus's help. He recalls from his vast knowledge of trains that their tracks can be switched. With a determined glint in her eyes, Violet gathers her hair and, with Sonny's unwavering optimism, manages to open a window. Using a bobblehead as their unlikely projectile, they successfully divert the train, narrowly avoiding disaster. Moments later, Mr. Poe arrives on the scene, seeing Sonny strapped in the front seat. He misconstrues the situation, believing she's the driver. Although Olaf tries to mask his sinister attempt, Mr. Poe sees through his facade. Deciding that allowing a small child to drive is unacceptable, he declares the children will no longer be in Olaf's custody. Mr. Poe takes the children to Dr. Montgomery Montgomery, a herpetologist by profession. The stark contrast to Olaf, Dr. Montgomery's home is clean and well-maintained, 
with one unusual exception, an elaborate indoor garden teeming with snakes of all kinds. From a double-headed cobra to a three-eyed toad, the collection is truly bizarre. The newest addition, a large black Tanzanian viper, sends shivers down their spines, especially when it nearly attempts to bite Sunny. Dr. Montgomery assures the children that despite its fearsome name, the viper is gentle and shy, and was not trying to bite the kid. As Dr. Montgomery excitedly announces a planned trip to Peru, Klaus notices a brass spyglass nestled on his hip. It's identical to the one he saw in his burnt house. Before he can question it, dinner is served, a delicious respite from their recent ordeal. After a satisfying meal, Dr. Montgomery, affectionately known as Uncle Monty, sings the children the same song their parents used to sing to them. He reveals his own tragic past, having lost his children, wife, and home to a fire, mirroring the bottler's own devastating loss. The next morning, the children receive an unwelcome surprise. Their trip to Peru is jeopardized. Gustavo, Dr. Montgomery's assistant, has suddenly fallen ill, and his replacement, a mysterious Italian gentleman named Stefano, arrives on short notice. The children, recognizing Count Olaf's disguise, are instantly suspicious. However, Dr. Montgomery, ever trusting, dismisses their concerns, believing them to be rude towards Stefano. The children try to warn Uncle Monty, but their attempts are met with misunderstanding. Dr. Montgomery believes Stefano is an imposter after his prized Tanzanian viper. The children try to explain the truth, but Stefano intervenes, urging them to sleep. Tragedy strikes the next morning. Dr. Montgomery is found dead, shattering the children's hopes of finding a loving family. The police arrive to investigate, and Stefano cleverly manipulates them into believing the viper is responsible. The children desperately try to reveal Stefano's true identity, but neither the police nor Mr. Poe believe them. In a moment of brilliance, Sonny approaches the viper, and instead of attacking, it gently plays with her. Before the police can confront Stefano, he flees. Mr. Poe, still oblivious to Olaf's true nature, takes the children to their next guardian, Aunt Josephine who lives in a precarious wooden house perched precariously over Lake Lacrimos. Klaus is puzzled by the lack of any close relatives among their guardians. Upon meeting Aunt Josephine, they discover a woman obsessed with grammar and plagued by constant fear of disaster. She warns them against entering the house too quickly, fearing they might trip and be decapitated. Inside, her paranoia manifests in various ways. She refuses to turn on the radiator for fear of explosion, forbids using doorknobs as they might shatter and injure her eye, and serves cold cucumber juice for dinner, fearing the stove might burst into flames. She even prevents Klaus from standing near the refrigerator, terrified it might fall and crush him. Over dinner, she shows them a photo album revealing a past life far removed from her current anxieties. The pictures depict a young, free-spirited Josephine taming lions and enjoying life. One photograph captures her, Dr. Montgomery, and the Baudelaire's parents together, all sporting the same brass spyglass Klaus had noticed earlier. However, upon questioning from Klaus, Josephine quickly hides the photo, leaving a trail of unanswered questions. Josephine warns the children about the leeches in the lake, blind creatures that swarm towards humans who have just eaten. She reveals that her husband, Ike, died after ignoring her advice to wait an hour before swimming in the lake. When she sees Klaus entering Ike's room, she asks him to respect her deceased husband's memory by staying out. Determined to help their aunt overcome her fears, the children and Josephine venture out to the market. There, they encounter Captain Sham, a self-proclaimed fisherman with a love for grammar. The children recognize Count Olaf's disguise, but Josephine, charmed by his image, falls for his trap. She invites him home while leaving the children to shop for dinner. Later that evening, amidst thunder and rain, the children return to find a broken window and a suicide note with glaring grammatical errors. Klaus deduces that this is a clue, not a genuine suicide note, and that Josephine is hiding in Curdled Cave. Before they can leave, the storm intensifies, doors blow off, and Klaus discovers photos of burning houses and a mysterious eye symbol in Ike's room. He wonders why Ike was investigating fires. Suddenly, everything Josephine warned them about happens. The fridge falls, the stove catches fire, and the glass doorknob shatters. When the storm subsides, they find themselves on a detached piece of wood, precariously hanging over the water. Violet, ever resourceful, saves the day and rescues her siblings. Refusing to involve the authorities, Violet urges Klaus to sail to Curdled Cave, where they find a sobbing but grateful Josephine. Initially, she refuses to return, even after learning about Captain Sham's forged will granting him custody of the children. However, Klaus exploits her fear of realtors and convinces her to board the boat. On the boat, Klaus shows Josephine the paper with the eye symbol and asks about Ike's investigation. She reveals that they were all investigating fires and the Baudelaire parents, as leaders, had discovered the answer leading to their deaths. 
Before she can elaborate, their boat is attacked by leeches. Count Olaf, ever present in their misfortune, arrives and takes the children away, leaving Josephine to the leeches. In a stroke of luck, Mr. Poe and the police arrive, and Count Olaf quickly pretends to be rescuing the children from the leeches. The ever gullible Mr. Poe interprets this as an act of heroism and rewards Olaf with custody once more. However, a twist awaits. Mr. Poe clarifies that any harm to the children would result in the inheritance being transferred to a blood relative or spouse. A wicked smile spreads across Olaf's face as he invites Mr. Poe and the police to witness his new play, Count Olaf and the Marvelous Marriage. The entire town gathers for the play as Violet and Klaus suspect Olaf's true intentions. Olaf's plan unfolds, Violet plays the bride to his groom, and Justice Strauss, their neighbor and a real justice of peace, is manipulated into unknowingly becoming the efficient on stage. Blinded by the excitement of her acting debut, Justice Strauss fails to realize Olaf's scheme to use her to validate a real marriage with Violet. When Violet refuses to participate, Olaf reveals Sunny locked in a birdcage high atop the tower, threatening to drop her if Violet doesn't comply. Klaus escapes the play and reaches the tower's base. Inspired by his sister's resourcefulness, he uses an old umbrella as a hook to climb. Reaching the top, he discovers a large lens attached to a movable frame on the window. When the sun peeks through the clouds, its rays hit the lens, and Klaus realizes the truth. Olaf used this lens to focus sunlight and set the bottle air mansion ablaze. The mysterious eye symbol he found in Ike's room was none other than this very window, with the lens. Back on stage, Violet has signed the marriage papers, and Olaf sheds his mask of innocence. He gleefully boasts of his elaborate plan, using the play as a facade to marry Violet and claim the fortune. He brandishes the marriage certificate, mocking the townspeople for not believing the bottle airs. But suddenly, as the sun briefly shines through the clouds, Klaus uses the lens to burn the certificate, leading to Olaf's arrest. He faces life imprisonment, subjected to the same torment he inflicted on the children. However, later reports reveal that a jury of his friends overturned his convictions, and Count Olaf vanished from the town. The bottle air children are back in the familiar backseat of Mr. Poe's car, searching for yet another guardian. They make a final stop at the charred remains of their mansion. Here, they find mail addressed to them. It's a letter from their parents, filled with exciting stories of their travels and encounters with amazing people. The letter ends with a reassuring message. No matter where they are, the children will always have a home in each other. A symbol of welcoming them into their secret society. A brass spyglass accompanies the letter. As the movie ends, Lemony Snicket, the narrator, finishes writing his book about the bottle air children's journey. Instead of taking it to a publisher, the mysterious narrator who is also sporting a brass spyglass hides it behind the clock face in a giant clock tower and leaves for someone to find it.